that information. I'll see you there. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, of course, just two um, announcements of significance. You would have recalled last week we officially commenced the 2024-2025 cruise season um, with the arrival of, of two ships. And thereafter, of course, as the season progresses, you'll be seeing more um, arrivals. Um, we expect in the calendar year 2024, um, to be the highest arrivals in any single calendar year, and that surpasses the year of 2019, as well as the highest number of cruise ships that will be docking in the harbor. Um, of course, you realize that the cruise season is analyzed in, in two ways. For the national statistics, the Social and Economic Review, it speaks of calendar year. Um, and therefore, um, calendar year is January to December. And like I said, we will see almost 825,000 arrivals um, for this calendar year, which is almost 200,000 more than last year's calendar year. But of course, the season crosses over years. So the cruise season actually starts in October, but ends in May. So the, the, the cruise season would stretch from October 2024 to May 2025. And for the upcoming cruise season, October 2024 to May 2025, we also expect to have the highest levels of arrivals. Um, so even both at a calendar year level as well as a season level, we're expecting to have the best season, better in that of 2019. Um, so we, we're super excited about, about those possibilities. And we're expecting to see um, a really vibrant uh, and, and very, you know, profitable cruise season. Um, it would also witness the start of our collaboration with GPH, Global Ports Holding, and we will see um, over the next few weeks the commencement of activity in relation to that agreement. Um, next week, um, GPH will present to the Cabinet of Ministers the final drawings for the various initiatives, the um, new vendors arcade, including the rearrangement of the waterfront for parking and traffic management for the Bannons Bay Fisherman's Village, um, the, the broadwalk at the front at the waterfront, as well as the upgrade of the Soufre waterfront. And of course, since we had the, the bad weather, they've had to be some um, adjustment of the plans for Soufre. But we will receive next week the final conceptual drawings. Um, and of course, thereafter is to submit to um, DCA for approvals. So we are seeing progress as it relates to um, the arrangement with GPH and we are already starting to see some of the benefits in terms of arrivals um, in, in relation to that uh, agreement that we have. And of course the second announcement um, would have to be, I'm sure you've heard over the weekend, we had the international launch of 2025 Carnival um, in Miami. Of course, Miami Carnival is strategically important because of the timing and the appeal of Miami Carnival for Carnival um, stakeholders. And St. Lucia had a very solid and powerful grouping that went to Miami Carnival. A number of our leading soccer artists um, were in Miami over the weekend. And today, of course, the um, parade and everything else that's taking place in Miami, St. Lucia is, 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 is present and very um, visible. Uh, it has worked well for us over the last few three years. We've launched international launch of St. Lucia Carnival takes place in Miami. Right now, every other Caribbean country is also now going to Miami as well. So it, it has really evolved as a major, um, you know, activity and certainly an exciting one. So St. Lucia, the, the draft calendar of private events was the preliminary calendar was released on the weekend and we can always make it available to you. You will see an increase in the number of you know the events. Of course, you will notice next year, Carnival is always the third Monday and Tuesday. And, and next year, that would fall, I think, 21st, 22nd of July. So we actually have more days for us to um, host activities. So we, we expect an excited um, calendar of events. We will be continuing our outreach. And over the next few weeks, um, St. Lucia Carnival will, of course, start to um, be promoted. In early November, we will be attending World Travel Market. 
and we will be making some major international announcements as it relates to the Jazz Festival. I think the lineup for the Jazz Festival um, has progressed quite nicely and we'll have some really exciting um, you know, artists on display and in London in, May, in November at World Travel Market. And of course, you probably would have heard by then, Julian Alfred will be accompanying us at World Travel Market as a tourism ambassador. And I mean, I don't have to repeat all the things she said about her deep, you know, um, you know, honor to be a tourism ambassador for St. Lucia. And it will be our first major outing with her um, in London. There'll be a number of activities organized in London for her. It's going to be a spectacular engagement in London. So we have some exciting um, news, exciting developments um, that will be taking place. Um, tomorrow, I'll be hosting a signing ceremony. And I'm sure um, you'll get some more information on this for the commencement of works on you know, a major hotel in St. Lucia. So, um, as we start the tourism season, 2024, 2025, um, there's a lot for us to be cheerful and a lot of us to be happy uh, about. So, uh, I'll take any questions you have. Yes, sir. Um, my question will be... Well, he has a mic. Uh. <laughs> Well, surpassing 2019 now. Yeah, so what would you attribute this? Is it just recovering the market or has it been our marketing or anything that will be bringing all these events to our show? Well, I, I think it's a combination of both. Um, we, we are seeing the market coming back to, to normalcy in terms of arrivals. But when you look at our increases, um, we, we are quite satisfied with the kind of outreach that we've been doing. The sales and marketing has really been aggressive um, for us to return um, to pre-pandemic pre levels. And, and you have to put into context our increases, especially in stay over visitors, at a time when we have a number of rooms out of the market. So you talk about 2019 when we were at our peak in terms of the number of rooms. But right now, although our numbers are the highest, and for every month we've seen increases in our arrivals over last year, and we surpassed in 2019 by 3%, you have to consider that the winner Morgan Bay was closed, and it's now going to become Secret St. Lucia, opening in December. So all those rooms are out of the market. You have to consider that the St. Lucian Hotel was broken down and was no longer in operation anymore. Um, and for the last few months, um, what we used to call Papillon or the, um, the Royal Ten, um, you know, w was closed long. And the Royal St. Lucian, which was Royal Ten Mystic, is also closed. So you're really talking about a situation where a number of large properties out of the market and those rooms not available, but yet our numbers are passing what it was in 2019. And also to add that even in the Caribbean market, we still not return to where we were in 2019. Um, of course, you know, we still have issues of connectivity and we're struggling all, despite all the positive news we've had for the last year, we're still struggling in terms of connectivity. So I think the, the US market has been really good for us, the Canadian market as well. Um, the UK market is still holding steady and we're expecting to see once we can get some of those hotels back on track, um, further increases. Well, we'll have more port calls, but maybe not a higher number of inaugural port calls. We will have some new port inaugural port calls, but maybe not as high as we had last year. Well, our issue is rooms. We don't have enough rooms in solution. I just made a point that despite our high numbers, our room stock has dropped. Um, but when you consider some of the properties that will come on stream over the next two to three years, um, St. Lucia will increase its room stock by almost 2,000 rooms um, over the next two to three years. And the issue is 
we cannot get more flights if we don't have more rooms, and you can't have more rooms if you're not building, if, you, if the airlines are not interested. So it's a kind of chicken and egg. But we expect over the next two to three years for our numbers to really take off because we will have the rooms. And what's also important is that those rooms are from hotels that have extensive inventories and, and networks. So for example, when you look at the secrets that will be opening, you know, it, you, you, they're part of, you know, secrets, dreams, whatnot. Um, the Marriott that will be opening at Point Seraphine and the new hotel at Ridgeway Beach will be part of the Marriott chain. Um, so you're talking about properties that will be opening that are part of international um, networks and they have the tremendous marketing and sales, um, you know, programs that will help us for sure to sell St. Lucia. Um, and we continue to, 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 to sell St. Lucia and to add, you know, products that we believe will differentiate St. Lucia from all other destinations. We're placing a heavy emphasis on community tourism, and we will be making more announcements you know, on what we're doing to add to the product to make sure that when we sell St. Lucia, we sell something that is slightly different to what the other territories are selling. Yeah, massively. Oh, no, no, my dear. Last year we had almost eighteen thousand arrivals for Carnival. Eighteen thousand. Yeah, overseas. This year we had close to twenty thousand arrivals in the first two weeks. Um, a lot of it for Carnival, and if you are wrong St. Lucia at Carnival time, you, you can see the sheer impact of the visitor impact, um, the visitor influence on our Carnival, um, and we will continue to grow. Next year will be even bigger than, than this year, and a lot of it is because of the international promotions that we do. Also to the bands, the Carnival bands do a, a fantastic job in terms of reaching out to revelers from overseas that do come in, spend a week, week and a half in St. Lucia the diaspora and through the tourism authority we have a program called Lucian Links which is our diaspora program where we reach out to St. Lucians to come back for those festivities for jazz for carnival and we have significant uptake in fact I think we're not doing enough um, and, and in November, early November, I will be going to New Orleans with a couple of persons from the Central Tourism Authority, again, to extend that outreach. So we, we need to do more. Um, the problem is we don't have many rooms to accommodate the numbers. With the diaspora, persons go and stay with their families, with their relatives, whatnot. Um, they stay in more of the Airbnbs. Um, but some of the international visitors still looking for rooms. And, and, and therefore, I think we can do even more. We can grow the festival even more. Of course, we have to deal with some other road management issues on parade days, whatnot. But St. Lucia has become known for its extensive you know, offerings in terms of boat rides, beach parties, fets, and concerts, whatnot. So it, it is important. You, you have to invest. You have to invest. You, you, you can't speak about growing the numbers and you focus just on the domestic market. The domestic market will not bring in um, 20,000 visitors by itself, so you have to reach out. And we'll continue to do so um, for jazz as well. We'll be doing some real big promotions to get more persons to come in. We have next month, next month, the Beach Festival, and as it's selling very, very well in terms of the French visitors that will come in. Um, for cricket, again, we, England will be coming to, to visit. The, the success of the Kings is already creating excitement for next year. Um, we now need to think strategically. So one of the things we're thinking about, and we have a meeting in London in November, um, for us to meet with some Indian travel agents to see how we can start tapping into the Indian market, um, both in the North America as well as in India, because Central Lucia Kings is owned by the same persons that own the Punjab Kings. So there was a buzz in, in India when St. Lucia won as well. So we need to start seeing how we can leverage this and get even more visitors to come into St. Lucia. Because remember, every time a visitor comes into St. Lucia, there's a certain amount of spend that takes place. It talks, you talk about car rental, you talk about food, beverage, you talk about you know, souvenirs, you talk about just enjoying St. Lucia, visiting sites and attraction. So the more persons you can get to come into the country and the more you can get them to spend in the country is the better for the economy. 
better you know for creation of employment and you know government taxes and everything else Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, in terms of wellness, St. Lucia is known as one of the leading destinations for wellness. And when we do get um, the Mon Pimad um, development, um, that, that would add significantly to our wellness offerings. Um, specifically, it relates to athlete recuperation. It's a very technical area. Um, you really need to have the facilities in place um, for athlete rehabilitation and recuperation. And we, we need something like that in social, not just for sports tourism. We need it for our own international athletes. And some of us have called over the years for a high performance center that offers the most modern equipment and facilities to allow athletes, our athletes first and foremost, when they do have injuries, to come back home and be able to recuperate and rehabilitate. But also, allow for, you know, athletes internationally who may want to come to St. Lucia to rehabilitate. Yeah, one more question. Um, an update on the, the underwater sculpture park. Um, yeah. Do we have any updates in America? Yeah, um, we're making a lot of progress. As I, t you know, this, this is an area of particular interest for me. The technical team started the dives on the weekend pass um, to identify the possible locations and sites. Um, so that has started. We have some... Um, divers here from overseas who are doing the technical assessment. Um, I think next week we will be announcing the winners of the storyboard competition and presenting them with their prizes. And, and so that, that is exciting. But we've started. Yeah, the work has started on this. Yes. Yes, Well, I think I've gone over this a few times here at press conferences already, and let me just go over it again. Um, when I became minister, um, the process had started before me. 15 years we had not issued one TX in St. Lucia, more than 15 years. Um, there were a lot of issues persons had with, with trying to regularize the sector. But we decided that what we were going to do was to do it in three phases. In the first phase, we were going to re-register all existing TX um, plate holders to ensure that they met all the requirements. The second phase, we, I, we asked all persons who had H plates that were involved in tourism transportation to indicate their desire to convert to TX plates. And, and that has been going on for the last few months. It's been an exhaustive process, but every single person, and I want to repeat it, every single person who had an H split legally involved in tourism transportation could apply and get it converted to a TX split. And I want to repeat it, uh, every single person who was legally involved in tourism transportation using an H split can apply for it to be converted to a TX plate. And the third stage is that we will be doing a tourism transportation demand study to tell us how many new TXs we can issue. And when that's completed, it will inform us whether we offer X amount of new TX plates. So you'll have the original TX holders, the converted H to TX, and the new TX plate holders. Um, and that, that's, that, that is the process that has been followed now. Also, added to that, we find a lot of persons who are in the taxi industry is complaining the fact that there are more taxi persons coming in and they need a TX. Um, they are saying that when they pass in, especially in the government's parking lot, they see they workers at government buildings. They are, they are also holders to taxi plates. So can you like explain that to us? Because they say there's an influx of persons getting TX plates who are not ready in the industry. 
again, I explained, we, there is an increase in TX because everyone who had an H split involving tourism transportation, who wanted to convert and was legitimately registered, they were converted. And I think there was almost over a thousand such H plates. But those were persons who were on the road carrying because there's an entire process, there are documents that you have to provide. So I can't comment on government workers with TX plates back outside the ministries. I, I can't comment on that. And what I could suggest is probably go around with the camera and take out some of those shots and, and, and carry it so people can see who those people are. But I, I don't, I, I have no such information that there are government workers with TX plates back outside ministries. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that anyone who converts from H to TX has to meet the criteria in terms of documentation and everything else as requested, as required by law. Um, so. Last you were here, you said you would get the information pertaining to the mass so you'll be able to update us. Prime Minister last week did say that you reached him and uh, you did inform him uh, that the uh, principal, um, the director Alexander Milosevic, uh, had uh, transferred his shares, or sold off his shares, since he has brought him into legal troubles. Are you with, but he did not know to whom the shares had been uh, sold. Can you confirm to us now, at this time, uh, who now has the uh, majority shares for the uh, Max Caribbean I invite you to wait for Parliament next week, Tuesday, where I will make a minister's statement on the CIP. Of course, it will be after your bombshell on Thursday, but I shall well, present to... Oh, so I don't know. I, I heard you. They said there's a bombshell coming this week. There's always a bombshell coming. But I'm going to wait for. Wait, can I ask um, you to wait for Tuesday, Parliament? I shall make a minister's statement on CIP, and I think you shall be smiling after. Pertaining to uh, the room stock, can you tell us how the Canals project will be able to augment our room stock? Simple. It will add rooms. Yes. How many? For the, which, when you say the Canals project, you talk about the complete project and everything Caribbean is finished. Galaxy, the Caribbean, yes, Galaxy project, you know, Both hotels and the residences. Yes. I think it will probably add, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but certainly over 500. And in terms of uh, how uh, the timeline for this project, have you visited the site of late? And what is your level of satisfaction in the work? Um, I have visited it. We have received presentations over the last two to three weeks by the developer, the construction companies, and we are fully uh, um, apprised of all the delivery timelines over the next few months. So as it stands now, you are, are they on, ta on target? Well, they, they've had some delays, like almost every project in St. Lucia in terms of raw materials, in terms of delivery, supply chain issues. Um, but yes, we generally satisfied with what was presented. All right. You've not been able to give us the numbers for whether the passport uh, that Galaxy has been able to, to sell because it's over for the shares, oversubscribed, and also what was allotted. Can, are you in a position now to, to inform us? Again, wait for Tuesday. Um, after your Thursday program, I'm sure I'll answer all the questions you raised then. And with regard to the infrastructure option? Again, wait for Tuesday. You will get all the answers that you want. Tuesday it is. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can always send me some of the questions you might want answered beforehand, just to make sure I answer all your questions. You, I'm sure you know how to contact me. You have. Uh, you've had for many years. So. Yeah. so all the questions you have, you could have asked me them. I could have answered them. But anyway, let's go on. But you have not consented to no, the I, that would have been asking for. Well, the last, time you wanted to last time you wanted to interview, the last time you wanted to interview me, I, I'm sure you you were quite um, creative in, in in getting me to answer some of your questions. But let, but we, can always, we can always we can all we can we can always talk. We, we'll arrange it. Trust me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well. Nah, we won't, we won't. We, we're better than that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions on Carnival, on thing? All right, if not, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Well, it was a very exciting 
activity yesterday in Monripo, and one that I had never even heard of before. Bring all your dirty clothes to the river and let's do some old time river washing. Let me tell you, that one really, that one really tickled me because you know I had not, I had never, I could not even have conceived of such a Creole month activity. But Monripo yesterday had a very exciting um, activity. The weekend before, Millet had a soirée. They had a very exciting activity as well in Millet. Um, but there are activities going on all over the place. Um, I see the advertisements. But yes, there, there, there is a steady build-up um, for Creole Heritage uh, Month and for International Creole Day. But I can also, we, I can always indicate to them that they probably need to do some more promotions. Yeah? Thanks. Yeah. Honorable Alfred Prosper, Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries, Food Security, and Rural Development will now address us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Just wanted to update the press on some recent activities held by my ministry and also my participation in two major events out of country. I want to first start by indicating that World Food Day is held globally on the 16th of October, and this year, the Ministry of Agriculture had a major uh, food festival held yesterday, and I didn't see anyone of you all there, surprisingly, held in Lakai at the IRDC, and it brought together hundreds of persons from St. Lucia to actually partake in the various food and all other products that were on display coming from our local farmers. Now, this year the theme for World Food Day is right to food for a better life and a better future. And that speaks to the importance of access to food, and not just food, but nutritious foods that can cause our populace to be healthy. A healthy nation is very important for the future development of any country. And so we had persons coming from Guyana, Cuba, Trinidad and Tobago, displaying a range of products made from our local commodities. World Food Day is very important to us, and I'm sure you would recall, or you've been hearing the term, 25% by 2025. And so it means that we are supposed to be reducing our food import bill by 25% next year. But you'd understand the challenges that climate change has been having on the agricultural sector. We just recently, sometime in May, June, we had a serious drought, followed by a hurricane in July. And that hurricane impacted St. Lucia agricultural sector, St. Vincent, Grenada, Jamaica. And so this has caused a setback in meeting our targets for 25 by 25. I recently attend a what you call the Caribbean Week of Agriculture that was held in St. Vincent from the 7th to the 11th. And it was really bringing ministers of agriculture, policy makers, private sector, and the key stakeholders in terms of the agricultural sector like FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, CADI, and the CARICOM Secretariat, as well as OECS, to really discuss the sector in the region, or CARICOM to be exact. And one of the areas that we focused on was the whole issue of climate change and how it is impacting the sector. As we speak, there are countries who have not been able to export much of its commodities like usual, especially St. Vincent, to the various countries because of the devastating effect that Hurricane Beryl had on those countries especially with regards to the agricultural sector. 
And so we have to take major decisions in terms of how do we address that problem in terms of climate change. And we now have to, we discuss a number of areas like agricultural insurance. Because what you find after a hurricane or storm has impacted the agricultural sector is that it can be very demotivating to our farmers. If our farmers do not have insur in agricultural insurance in the region, and it's causing serious problems for those farmers who suffer major losses but has difficulty actually getting back into the sector. And very often, it takes the government of those countries to compensate those farmers and fishers in the sector. So I just want to mention that the CARICOM Minister of Agriculture, we had a number of ministerial meetings in St. Vincent, and we, we came up with a plan to chat away forward to be able to deal with the sector. The issues of transportation within the region was a major, major issue of concern. Farm labor was also a major discussion because the farm labor issue is not only in St. Lucia. It spans throughout the CARICOM, throughout the region, and concerns were raised as to how to deliver this matter, and recommendations were made in terms of bringing persons from outside. Something similar to the Canada, Canada Farm Labor Program, where we may have to get maybe various individuals or companies to bring in a number of persons within the region based on their need to be able to address this farm labor problem. Now I know if that happens in St. Lucia, there are political implications to be considered. Because the first thing that will be said is the government of St. Lucia is actually importing farm labor into St. Lucia and is creating further problems for the unemployed young men in the country. But it's a matter that is seriously impacting the agricultural sector. And if we have to reduce our food import bill, if we have to meet our target of 25% 25 by, 25 by 2025, we need to deal with all those challenges. So I just want to state it was a very good meeting that we had in um, St. Vincent. And we are hoping that the discussions will not only remain discussions, but policy decisions that would lead to actions to address the alien agricultural sector. I also attended on the 1st and 2nd of October in Grenada an EU Caribbean Global Gateway meeting on Sagasam. We all know that Sagasam is becoming a major concern. It's probably one of the major environmental problems affecting the region, and we know how it affects our tourism because the beaches are very often littered with Sagasam. And we had a conference to look at what can be done. How can we convert what we call a challenge to an opportunity? And there was major discussion about how we can use the Sagasam to create or use it for agricultural inputs and all of the other things that we can use the Sagasam to be able to move from a challenge, as I said, to an economic opportunity. But the action points at the end of the two-day meeting was we are going to establish a secretariat, a secretariat as a specific office for Sagasam, and it will be established in the Grenada. There, is, there was also action in terms of collecting more information, data on Sagasam. There was also concerns that we need to do more monitoring, data sharing, information sharing, because there are countries like Cuba, Guatemala, and those countries that are using the sagasam and converting it into products that have caused economic opportunities for the young people and other business and private sector-led people in the various countries. We, as you, you can see when you drive along the east, coast of St. Lucia, my constituency in Denry, Monripo, Miku, all the way to Vifort, the build-up of Sagasam in terms of littering our beaches and making it difficult. Because there is a health concern, a stench and everything. People have always been making um, the point that it is something that needs to be addressed. But as we speak, the government of Japan is, through the UNDP, 
is working on a project where specified or specialized equipment will be made available to countries like St. Lucia, Dominica, Grenada, St. Vincent to really deal or to manage the whole sargassum problem in St. Lucia. So I just wanted to mention that those three, three um, areas that I mentioned just to inform the public as to some of those developments. Well, well, St. Lucia and all the countries in CARICOM, because the, t the target is a CARICOM target. And St. Lucia's target is the same 25% reduction here, like any other country. But the issue we have in St. Lucia, we have a major problem with data collection. Our food production sometimes is extremely high, but now you would go to the supermarkets and see little or no bananas, all right, bananas simply because we had a weekend burial. And obviously, the first set of farmers that would be affected would be the banana and plantain farmers. These plants or trees are very vulnerable to strong winds. But I remember in the first phase of the, and that is why the seven, the, the seven crops project under the Taiwanese funded program was implemented to help St. Lucia address the problem. But so far, I do not think we have done much. We have achieved much in terms of the target. As I said, because the data is not forthcoming and we have issues collecting the data. Um, the data is not forthcoming from, from my ministry. Okay. And sometimes the farmers do not willingly provide the data. Right, because tomato is very sensitive to consistent high rainfalls. And you'd see that not just tomato, but you'd not see too many watermelons around this time. You would not see too many cantaloupes around this time because those fruits are actually on the ground. And those plants or crops are very sensitive to consistent heavy rains. In tomatoes, because of the fact that the flowers are very easily damaged from heavy rains. A lot of farmers do not go into production of tomatoes during that time. And that's why from January down to May, June, you'd see a glut in tomatoes. But around this time, it's always a problem. Okay, so these are not new problems, right? What's that? I, I say these are not new problems. These are situations yes. And so this is why... For decades, we would yes. know of why we have glut or why yes. we have scarcity. Um, right. The same way the region would know we have the climate change issues, we have heavy rainfall, we have uh, stronger storms, we know that. So in the planning of this whole initiative, did not the region consider the, the um, well, these this issues, uh, the, the challenges that you would have encountered in actually meeting your targets for you to address these issues, like the data issues, the other yes. issues? Well, you will not know when a, a hurricane is coming. No one knows that, eh? Drought. We never expected to have a drought period in August last year. So I'm just saying these are things that we have no control of. But under the World Bank program, we realized that during the period of the rainy season, what we call shade agriculture is the way to go. And this is why under the World Bank program, we are going to assist more than 200 farmers with greenhouses. But if you drive past those areas, you'd see the metal structure but the plastic is missing. So we are going to make available plastic to those farmers in addition to purchasing or procuring 45 new greenhouses under the program. Because we cannot be saying every year that because of that period, August to December, we can produce tomatoes. There are ways, new technology that can be used to do it, but it's costly to some of the farmers because the greenhouses during hurricanes and and, and other natural disasters. They are destroyed and it's costing farmers quite a bit to be able to replace the plastic. The structures are, are there, as I've said, and if you go on, you'll see the structures are there, but they have no cover. Okay, I understand what you're saying, but that's what, mm. I, what I'm asking, because these are not new issues and the technologies are not new. 
right. Either. But the technologies right. cost money. Understood. That's right. But as a regional initiative, mm -hmm. CARICOM initiative, why is it? Because what I'm seeing from my assessment, because I've listened to a few of your meetings mm -hmm. in the past few years, it seems there isn't a political will, I think, to really put agriculture um, to, to the, 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 the focus that needs to be on agriculture. We're not seeing that. Because wow. Because if you compare it with excuses and ex excuses, that is my opinion. That's your opinion. But, but let me also, let me mm, okay, sorry. When you look at the studies that the FAO would have done and other um, um, international agencies, they they bring up the same problem. So it tells me that we are not listening to what they're saying to do. I mean, okay, now you're saying this, but I'm sure five years from now we'll have um, either you or another minister of agriculture repeating the same thing. Yes. Now right? so what is that plan to deal with this? So I just want to tell you, new technology is the way to go in agriculture. Because our farmers, we have been doing the same thing all the time, and we have to change. Because climate change is actually forcing us to do that. It is telling us that the way we are doing things, we were doing things 10 years ago, must change. And this is why we've procured fertilizer to assist our farmers. We've given our farmers over 2,000 1,000 gallon water tanks because we understand the importance of storage of water. The greenhouse agriculture, we are doing that. And when you say that the support for agriculture is not there, we are going to receive in the next few months $144,000 US dollars from, for the, from the government of Guyana to set up an agricultural innovation project at Union. The site has, is going to be cleared very shortly for that to happen. We are going into insurance insurance that is very critical for the sector because every year every time there is a natural disaster our government has to take taxpayers money to assist the farmers and we have to do that because food security is important but we must move from the practices of the past and to move in a direction where we focus on what we call climate smart agriculture it will not happen overnight you have to go through a transition because you have to educate your farmers. Your farmers, the farmers and fishers have to understand the importance of it as well. But this is the direction we must go, and this is where our government wants to take this sector to be able to deal with all those challenges that you mentioned. One more question. Yeah. If I pass it to my colleagues, we need to be wary right now. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if we got the introduction of uh, farm labor from outside, yes. You see, the farmers are saying, the farmers are saying that they are not getting the labor support that once existed. There is a farmer in Sufwe with 30 acres of good agricultural land, but he's saying he may have to leave the sector because he needs about 20 workers, but he only gets about three or four. The, I don't know what has happened to some of our young people, but they do not seem to be attracted in terms of providing farm labor. Now, if you have an issue with farm labor, obviously the production will be impacted. And this is why we saw this. And currently, we have 115 workers providing assistance to more than 200 farmers by helping them reduce the cost of production. Because it's one thing to come in and say, I'm paying this gentleman $60 a day. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> you invest, but you, when you harvest, you have a hurricane or you get a glut in the market and you cannot really get the, you know, the, the profit or the income that you expect at the end. So it's a problem. And it's not a problem only in St. Lucia. St. Vincent, all islands in the region did indicate that that is becoming a major problem. Dominica is already getting labor from Haiti. But I wish we would not have to go that way because we have so many young men who are available, who are unemployed. <clears throat> but they seem not to be attracted by that kind of, you know, activity on the farms. Have a yeah, well, that would be great. A step, a step program. program. Very good. So then, along those lines, Minister, what then is the status of the youth in agriculture program? Because I believe when it was conceptualized, that really was the thrust to get That's people right. into it. So what has happened to that program, and why are we not seeing 
that desired result to transform them uh, into... That program is a failure. We actually engage a number of young people in the South, and if you drive down to Shoesdale, you'll see those massive greenhouses that were assigned to a few of the young, the young persons. They only spend, I think, a year or two, and they actually abandon the project. Do we know why that is? I think it is because their concern had been financial support, which I do not think was the case, because we had an arrangement with a particular bank to provide the support, but they just eventually left. And now we are actually upgrading those greenhouses to lease to other farmers. I mean, we know the issues that our young people have. I'm, I'm, I don't want to, to just blame our young people. There are a number of young people that, since I became the Minister of Agriculture, that are generating interest in agriculture. I speak to them, I make remarks to them very often when the Taiwanese would train them in various operations in, in terms of the sector. But I believe there is something that must, that has to happen to get them in. And I believe it's new technology and innovation. I think that is what will attract the young people. But it's a concern to me, it's a concern to the government, and it's supposed to be a concern to every single St. Lucian because if we do not get the young people to be attracted in agriculture, the older folks who have been there 40 and 50 years ago, they are on their way out. And what is going to happen, we're going to have a serious gap. And it's going to make more problems for us in terms of our food import bill, food security, etc., etc., et cetera. But it's a very good question, and I agree with you. We need to do more to get them interested in agriculture. I, don't, I would not say we are less food secure. I don't think we have reached a crisis in St. Lucia where we cannot get food, except soon after a major hurricane. But I believe that our food import bill is too high, and we need to do more to reduce it drastically. And the other, one other question, we know that CARICOM had uh, made Target. Guyana, pardon me, yeah. Guyana, in, in line with what mm. the CARICOM did, mm -hmm. Guyana did make a proposal of Right. Has. Yep. Has into that? There is no need for us to plant anything outside of St. Lucia. We have a lot of land space. If you drive down the east, you drive down the west, you drive down the parts of St. Lucia, you will see a number of the abandoned banana fields. And we have a program where the government made an allocation. I think it's about $350,000 for us to go in and rehabilitate those abandoned lands. So I think we have enough land. I think what we need to do is to really continue to provide the support to our farmers so we can encourage them to produce more of what we eat. Thank you very much. And lastly, from me, still on the 25 by 25 mm -hmm. target, um, are we doing what's required of us to ensure that we're making a valuable contribution? Because that is such a lofty goal, and honestly, I don't see us accomplishing that by 2025. So are we, doing, are we really playing our part? Well, all the countries are playing their part. But you see, the part that we play is to increase our production. But our production cannot only be increased in watermelons, in, in um, cucumbers, and sweet pepper. We have to increase it in all of the basic commodities like cabbage and tomatoes. And we need to have a year-round production level that may even allow us to export the excess. We are doing that, but there are challenges, challenges we have no control of like climate change. I mean, our farmers just recovered from the last year we got in June, storm in June, I can't remember the name. And they were ready to market their bananas late last year, December, into January. And soon after, we have another hurricane. So every time they are getting ready to make money, generate an income, a regular income, natural disasters are impacting their ab ability to do that. So yes, we want to achieve that target, which I know, based on discussion in St. Vincent last week, we may not be able to achieve that target because of all those challenges that we did not anticipate would happen. Thank you, sir. Most welcome.
Good morning. Um, I would um, I like to deal with three issues. One, the unemployment, the unemployment, the latest unemployment st st statistics. Two, the First National Bank issue, and three, I have a bombshell. <laughs> Which one do you want first? <laughs> which one? Which one? You want? So I tell you three of them. I tell you, on, I tell you unemployment. I tell you first national. I tell you a bombshell. Which one do you want first? First national. First national. Well, as you know, the first national insurance, first national bank, is a purely private entity. The government has no no shareholdings in the first national bank, but as a minister of finance, the the climate of the financial system is, is, is important to me. I've been concerned at the, labor at the labor stoppage at First National, and I'm, I'm calling on all parties to get back to the bargaining table as soon as possible to ensure that, we, that work continues, not interrupted work, but work continues smoothly at First National. As to the issues, I have not been briefed on, on the issues, as I said, because the bank is a purely private entity. But I will be making a call to the chairman of the bank to ask him his side of the story. And I also will be calling the labor commissioner later today. But he hope that good sense prevails and the workers return to work as soon as possible. And that will have to be the responsibility of management to get together with the workers so that we can end up with a win-win situation. But as, as the Minister of Finance, I'm very concerned with of any instability in the financial system and First National Bank being out of work can create some level of instability in the system. Well, I'm very pleased. As I said, I told you I have not been briefed. I'm very pleased that the workers have gone back to work, and I hope that doesn't occur again, not only in the First National, but in any financial institution, that because, you know, we want a harmonious relationship to exist between workers and employers. And this is why we pass a minimum wage so we could get workers should have be able to give a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. And I'm very happy that has happened. That, I agree with you, it was but, too late. Um, shouldn't this be addressed now? Couldn't she put her, the other matters on hold given the urgency of the situation? Well, I'm just told that the workers have gone back to work, so something has happened. So I'm very pleased that the workers have been back, uh, have been back at work. Yeah. Doesn't this issue speak to a deeper, maybe challenge in the banking sector? Because we saw Bank of St. Lucia's workers striking not too long ago, now First National Bank, and, and other other institutions, um, just from my, my speaking to people, um, might be also on the verge of, of, of doing certain things. I hope not, but uh, might be also on the verge of... Other institutions, things. like? So, banking institutions, so other banks. Oh, so Nusha has three banks, so the other one is for Caribbean, right? Well, Republic Bank. Republic Bank, Bank. Yeah. You see, uh, you know, um, I, I just wanted to make, to make that clear. Banks are private institutions. The government, the government of St. Lucia, you may not believe it, is not the majority shareholder at the First National Bank, at the Bank of St. Lucia. You may not know, it's not. The government of St. Lucia as an entity is not the major shareholder at Bank of St. Lucia. Government's involvement in the private sector, in the banking sector, is done basically through the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, who are the regulators. 
So the government of Lucia, in terms of banking, except the development bank, where the government is the only shareholder, the government is not involved in the private banking in, in, by private banking business, except the development bank. So First National Bank is a completely private entity. Bank of St. Lucia, private entity with government having shares. Government as an entity in itself is not the major shareholder. So these issues have to do with management and the workers. And as you know, any government interference in banking, we are called PEPs, politi politically exposed persons. That puts us at, at a great disadvantage, even in our private matters, the in the banks. So I just want you to read that the government doesn't just enter into the bank like, like before the government was, was the main shareholder at Bank of St. Lucia. Government is not the main shareholder at Bank of St. Lucia. The next issue is the unemployment. The Central Statistical Office has published the latest labor force data for the second quarter of 2024, which is April to June. To June. The national quarterly unemployment rate for the first half of 2024, that is January to June, have declined to record low levels in over 12 years. From April to June 2024, the unemployment rate averaged 11.25%. This is the lowest quarter two unemployment rate since 2012. The quarter two unemployment rate of 11.25% in 2024 represents a 2% 2 decline compared to the same period in 2023 and a 6.2% lower than the quarter two unemployment rate in 2022. The job numbers for the first six months of 2024 are at an all-time high. And I, you may recall, I've told you that my aim is to get unemployment to single digits. If the trend continues, if the trend continues, barring any unforeseen circumstance, I believe that Shen Lucia will attain, will, will attain the single digit unemployment rate, if not in the next quarter, the quarter after. I'm very pleased the, with that growth, and we hope it continues, barring any unforeseen circumstances, which, which I mentioned to you the last time. We see um, the record uh, unemployment rate levels, but what exactly has the government done um, to encourage these levels? Um, because, um, I mean, we see the figures, but we, we don't always know what happens behind the scenes. So can you tell the public exactly What happens what? behind the scenes <laughs> is new businesses. They, they, they create an enabling environment, creating the environment for businesses to expand, creating the youth economy where young people are given grants, creating the MSME where, where, where people are given 70% loan and 50% grants. Creating an enabling environment as far as incentives are concerned, in that the government does not get involved in the incentive nature. So you don't have to go to a minister's office to wait. These processes and procedures have been hastened, have been clarified. The, the, the prime minister is not the final arbiter when it comes to giving incentives. The New Tourism Development Act has, has, has been passed. There are a number of, of interventions the government has taken to make business more transparent and to make business easier for people. Plus the fact, plus the fact that the economy is benefiting from the expansion of the tourism industry. This year, our cruise figures will be in excess of 800,000 cruise passengers will be coming to St. Lucia this year. And then we are hoping that we can get, in fact, the Minister of Tourism, we have told you, that we're getting the Rangers back, back, back in gear. 
because the Rangers were stopped in 2016 by the last government. So we get the Rangers back so we can enhance the security for our visitors in terms of our cruise passengers. That comes in Russia. So it's the, the economy is expanding. It is clear that the economy is expanding. It is clear by the figures. It's clear by the, un, by the unemployment figures. And hopefully, we should get to a historic single-digit unemployment in this country, something that has never happened before. Of course, it, it would be construction and tourism. The construction and tourism. And in fact, yes, and that's, that is, that's coming to my other bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> that there are three mega projects to be launched in St. Lucia momentarily. One, the Pope site, the Rodney B Shopping Center. Work has started on this on, 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 this, on this project. Number two, two hotels are commencing shortly on R Radway Beach. The lease is going to be signed tomorrow. And the two building, two hotels that are there are going to be demolished. Two new hotels are going to be built on, on, on that side. The two existing hotels are going to be demolished. Number three, the Mont Pinal Hotel. Workers have started on the Mont Pinal Hotel. So hopefully, before the year is ended, we should have more than 500 construction jobs. We should, all, we should also add to the unemployment, reduce the unemployment levels. So this is a great, great bombshell. I mean, it should be like a bombshell. Three mega projects starting in one time in the country. So, so that is, just, our, just for clarification, that is Starfish and Mystic that will be... Um, taken down, yes. The well, lease um, is going to be signed tomorrow. The lease, the lease is going to be signed tomorrow. Workers started on Mont Pinal and work on the Rolly Bay Shopping Center as well as the land has been cleared, etc. But these are temporary jobs for the long run, right? All jobs are temporary. Mine is. <laughs> <laughs> with, with all the concern, PM and you very often stress uh, climate change. What are some of the resilience uh, factors you that come into play here with the rebuild of these two hotels within each month? Okay. First of all, we have, in all these hotels, the factors to mitigate against climate change are taken into consideration. First of all, climate change is a real situation. Climate events are real, real situations. You could ne so what do we do? In terms of things like water harvesting, we are ensuring that all these projects have their water harvesting capabilities. In terms of renewable energy, in terms of new forms of energy, all these hotels. So in terms of environmental precautions, environmental safety, environmental, environmental concerns, all of these are taken into consideration as far as this project is concerned. Right now, you cannot, you cannot build unless these things are taken into consideration. In terms of, there is no way that any government or anybody can decide when a hurricane two will turn into hurricane five overnight. There's absolutely no way. What we, what we can do is take, put the measures in place and hope, and I can say hope, that the hurricanes do not create untold devastation. But to tell you that we can sit here and see X is going to happen. To avoid certain things, we can't. This is something that we have not got any control over. But the buildings are being built to mitigate, to, to mitigate and to adapt to the climate situation. But if we keep using our beachfront prime minister, and I'm sure you are sensitive to that, it places not just the investors uh, and the investment at risk, but it also leads to that sort of devastating for the island itself, and I'm speaking specifically of whether the tourism industry in St. Lucia and the rest of the region, if we continue to do those beachfronts, will be insurable at all, because there's a lot of talk, and you would know this, within the in international uh, insurance industry, and the cost then 
will be passed on to the very visitors that we are trying to attract and in the long run make it as quite unaffordable. Yeah, I'm um, agreed. Agreed. The, the cost insurance is an issue. In fact, I am supposing to work with Prime Minister Mia Motley on insurance because, as you know, you're right, insurance costs are very high, but investors have measured their risk. And if, if investors have measured their risk, investors want to invest, the government will not see, not do not invest because we think that there'll be some situation in the future. The investors have done all the analysis, just like you, just like me, and they've found that the risk can be taken and they are taking it. So let's hope for the best. I, that position has not been taken now. I don't know for the future. <clears throat> the who? Oh, yes, yes, yes. The update is that investors have come forward. In fact, we have an agreement with an investor to restart that project, but that hasn't come to fruition as yet. No, 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 no. The minimum wage will start from the first. It doesn't mean rolling around nowhere. No, 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 no. Listen, it has been there. Governments come and go. You're the only one to implement it. Just give me your opinion about you coming. The only one. Government come, government go. But you implement it. We've done a lot of. Yes, you understand. I'll tell you something. Um, the, um, I don't want you. Hold, hold, hold on, sir. Let me give you my hold on. Yes, yes. And uh, today we have different business houses who support or who do not support the minimum wage. Let's give me your thoughts on that, please. Thank you. You see, I'll tell you something. Any policy must be aimed at the greater good of the majority. Every policy should be aimed at the greater good for the majority. Now, in the environment that we live now, in the environment of the Ministry of Truth, anything and everything, people will create their own history. And that is, uh, that is what um, I am, that is what people will create their own history. Fact is, this government is the first government that has implemented a labor wage. That's a fact. Secondly, we are the first government that have increased pensions. That is also a fact. So that the history that can be created is going to be history that will be created. People will, will make up their own history. That was the intention, or it should be higher. Well, you know, but you live in that world, so you understand. But what I want to tell you is that I want to urge businesses to look at the bigger picture. Initially, it may cause a cash flow issue for some businesses. But with the expansion of consumption, and the, the economists will tell you there's a marginal propensity to consume, particularly at lower income levels. So that is a fact of the subject. At lower income levels, people consume more. So I'm urging businesses to be patient in terms of what is the multiplier effect of the increase in the minimum wage. So it's, it's going to be rolled out this month, but also, you must also know it's for a 40-hour week. And this is why we opened the labor office, the minimum wage office, to explain to people clearly how this thing works. But tell you the truth, regardless of the history that's written, I'm very pleased that I was the prime minister, together with, with a government of the Labor Party, to implement the first minimum livable wage in St. Lucia. And, if, and even though the history is contorted, the facts will remain the same. And as also the first Prime Minister to increase pensions for people on NIC to from $300 to $500. I'm very pleased that I have had the opportunity of my cabinet to do that. And the history, even though it's changed, can, even though it's rewritten, cannot change that. Okay, can I ask yes. Yes. Um, the first one is, is there a, a shortage of medical supplies at ONT hospital? The second, um, the, some of our doctors resigned at least three. 
at this time, sorry, and what's the latest with Central's hospital? Is there a shortage of medical supplies and medicine? And to ask you a direct question, is a shortage of what, what medical supplies? What? They always, well, I'm not sure myself. I will ask the Minister of Health to, to help in, in this regard. And I also heard, I don't know if you heard, after the problems, the Hurricane Helen in Miami, that there was a shortage of stuff for dialysis in Miami, supply chain problems, because they said the, 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 the factory was destroyed. How that impacts Donald T. You know, it's always, it's always very easy to find, not to find the causes for certain things. Now, we do not produce medical supplies in St. Lucia. The Minister of, Dom, the Minister of Health was in Dominica on Wednesday dealing with medical supplies, the supply chain for medical supplies. We do not create medicines in St. Lucia. We do not. We have to import it. And there are issues down the, the, the supply chain as they relate to medicines and medication. Many issues. Whether there is a shortage of certain medical supplies, I cannot say yes, I can't say no. I will find out. What I know is that we've put in 11, we put in $11 million into OEKU, OKU to help pay debt from 2016 and 2017. And right now we are having an, we are having an audit on debt that was due from the Ministry of Health long before July. Long before July 2021, we started with heavy debts in the Ministry of Health, which we now are going to clear up. There's an audit to ensure that these, these figures for the payables are correct, and I'm going to make a statement on payment of these debts at, at a very short, at a very, in, a, in, in, in a very short time, once I have the information. So I don't want you to... Rewrite the, rewrite the history and pretend that from July 2021, there has been shortages at, 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 at OKU. Not that we are making excuses. We are saying it's something that was happening and we've taken decisive steps. We haven't spoken about it. We haven't blamed anybody. We've spoken the facts and we've taken decisive steps. By putting $11 million in to OKU, a decisive step, a measurable step, not a talk step. And we're also going to clear, I'm told, that we owe France, the French government, $2.2 million from 2001 for medical services that solutions took in France. I'm going to try to pay it. I'm taking a decisive step to pay it. You understand? So my, our job as a government is to do things that are measurable, not do things that people think about or talk, talk about it in the, in, in the atmosphere. You can go, and I'm going to give you that challenge to go out and look at the manifesto of the Labour Party, the things we said we would do, and checklist. I put a challenge to you that we, as a people, We'll go in one day and take a checklist on things we did. Not things we say we would do, or not things we would have done, or not things that, 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 we, do, that we had as a, as a rendering. Real things. That's one. Number two, in terms of St. Jude Hospital, work is going on, work is going on at St. Jude Hospital in a satisfactory manner. The four buildings are going to be completed. Very soon, the four buildings, and what is going on in the rest of the hospital. So, I'm very, very pleased with what's happening there. For the first time, we have a designated line of finance for St. Jude. For the first time. So, we have the money to compete St. Jude. For the first time. For the first time. But, you must also know that we are carrying debt for St. Jude which we are paying. We've met, we've meeting the responsibilities because we are a responsible government. 
We are carrying debt for St. Jude, which we are paying. But why is we doing that? The, the St. Jude Hospital expansion and renovation is continuing, and very shortly, we'll be able to give you a date when that long horror will end. I heard so that some doctors design is very is not a situation which is which, which I will I'm happy about, but people always need to look for greener pastures and, it's, and again that's nothing new. <laughs> doctors resign and they come in all the time. We we are paying we pretend that these things are new, it never happened before in television history. You know, as I said about you must really read the Ministry of Truth, the, the rewriting of history. It's really, it's a, it's a fantastic book. I, I really want you to read it. I can give, I have a copy. I want to give Shane a copy to read. She, it's really a really good book to read. I really want you to read it. Yes. Yes. The who? Project. Yes. Yes. Sure. Sure. The HI, the preferred, you know, as, as I told you, as you know, it's in two components, right? It's the runway part, the runway, which is a cut cup project, and there's the, there's a terminal, the terminal, and uh, the terminal and the control tower. The control tower work has been going on on there, but there's been recently they've stopped work on the control tower because there's been some rearrangement of the, with the contractor. The contractor and SLASPA, they've come to a, a mutually acceptable position where the contractor will stop working on the, 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 the tower and the new contractor will be chosen. It was done amicably and done well. So we're waiting for that process to continue so work can continue on the, so work can continue on the, the on, on, on the, control tower. As far as the terminal is concerned, you know that we got a consultant and consultants to look at a new a reconfiguration of what existed for the terminal building. I was not putting Saint Lucia through, through, through that, that expense. We've got a new configuration and you, we also know that the largest, the largest infrastructure program in Saint, pro, project in Saint Lucia would have been built without tendering. The largest infrastructural project in St. Lucia would have been built without tendering. Would have been built by one man deciding who to do it. Very soon, we are going to be tendering. Slasma is going to be tendering for the construction of the new terminal building. That tender will be, I am told, should be all before the end of the year. It's going to be an international tender. When that happens, we're going to have the tendering process going through and a tender, a contract will be selected and work will commence on the terminal building. But why is it speak? Work on the CADCOP building, which, which is the, the CADCOP project, which is the highway, is continuing. All things, are, all things are possible with God and man. But it's, a, it, it, it's an ideal. You see, I'm glad you asked that question. You see, uh, this is my philosophy. My philosophy is we always look at the glass half full. I have hope in the people of St. Lucia. I believe in the young people of St. Lucia. I believe in them. I have hope in them. Right? My job as a prime minister is to create the enabling environment for these young people to, to be. Lots of things are happening. I was in Mexico. I'm thinking that very soon I'll be able to make some announcements on scholarships in Mexico. You see, good things are happening. Many good things are happening. The government has given, up, given out hundreds of scholarships over, over, over the last year. We, so that's where we get into. So we are striving to get to the top. 
Julian Alfred showed we can get to the top. What I want to happen in this country is we have to stop this peddling of negativity and not having any faith or confidence in ourselves. We must have more faith and confidence in ourselves as people. I'm not asking anybody to have faith and confidence in politicians. In ourselves as people, we must stop this negativity in our country. It's not good for us. It's not good for the country. I've, I've said so several times before, for all those who have ears, let them hear. My job is a temporary job. Whilst I'm there, I'll try my best. It's a temporary job. So it's no need you try to burn the house to kill the rat if you think the rat is disturbing you. Find a way. Put a rat trap. <laughs> Don't burn the house. Because when you burn the house, it's going to be very, very, very difficult to preside over, over, the, over the ashes. We, we've been there before, you know. We've been there before. I don't know if you remember, in 2016, many promises were made, you know. We've been there. We've been there. We don't, 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 we haven't been, in 2016, many promises were made. Things were stopped. And this, that. Look, look, at the, 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 eh? look at the end result of that. You know, as a people, we must always remember our history. What we try to do now is to rewrite that history. But remember the facts of that history. We were there before in 2016. We were there before. And 2021 came. We were there before. Including COVID. We never thought COVID would come. COVID came. So let's not believe that when we burn the house, we'll be able to rebuild it because we've changed the prime minister. No. Not going to be rebuilt. Not going to be rebuilt. We were there before. And look at what happened. I just want to tell you, let us, as a country, be a little more positive. Um, having some new information from him is that the First National Bank employees are still, um, well, they're not on strike, but there is a plan to seek out. So the issues that the bank has still have. You still, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, 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 do you think it should be, the Labour Minister should be called back? I will, I, will have a, I will have a call in with the Labour Commissioner and the chairman of the board as soon as I leave here. I, I'll have a call into it. Yes, um, you want to see? Um, yeah. I'm going to be a question to you. Um, a little bit of crime, um, the CC. The who? Yeah, the CC. Cameras. Mm. Um, your, your position is accusing. The what? That is not true. That's not true. That's not true. The C that is not that is not true. The C the CCTV works. The CCTV works. It works and it works. You see, and I cannot, you know. You think that if you are very serious about crime in a country. You will, you will alert criminals that it, that the cameras work or not. You think that, do you think that's a really responsible position to take? Do you think that's a really responsible position to take? That even though you know they don't work, which is not true, you'll alert prisoners, you alert criminals. You think that's responsible? Do you think that's responsible? Do you think a responsible opposition should do that? Martin is a colony of France. St. Lucia is, is, an, is, an, is a department of France. St. Lucia is an independent country. Remember some time ago when you all ridiculed me, or some people tried to ridicule me, when I said Martinique 
it's part of Europe. You know, it's really cool. I mean, for for reasons I, I never knew why. I never knew why I was I, I was really cool. But that, but that, that happens when 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 you're in my job. What happens to Martinique is being a department of France, the people of Martinique expect to have the same benefits as France. Saint Lucia is an independent country. So the situations are very different. Well, the on on Tuesday next week, the report from the CIP unit, the annual report is going to be tabled in the Parliament. I expect the minister to make a statement. I expect him to give an update as to where all these things are. Um, that's, that's his responsibility. I expect him that next Tuesday. What I can tell you is that we are proceeding with, with our year of infrastructure. Um, the government had also allocated some money for the infrastructure, which is happening now. You see Social Road being is, is starting. You see some roads in, in the north, in the north starting. Um, so our infrastructure, as far as the government is concerned, is going fine. As far as the infrastructure option is going to be, which you spoke about, the minister will advise on Tuesday. Is that to say that the government has not yielded any revenue as yet from Caribbean Galaxy regarding that? As far as... <laughs> the minister will have the answers for that, but let me tell you only what, what I've said before about passports. And, you know, it's the sad thing that we use the word passports. What I've said before, very clearly, very clearly, when a document, when a citizenship is allowed by the CIP unit, a citizenship by the CIP unit, it's converted into a passport. The passport is given by the Department of Immigration, just like for you and for me. So there's a fundamental difference between giving the physical passport, what happens before, there's a fundamental difference. I've tried to make that point very, very clear. There's a, we use the word passports very loosely. It's a fundamental difference. When a passport is given, three things have happened. One, there's been a bond. Two, there's been an investment in National Economic Fund. Or three, there's been an investment in a real estate option. That's what happens when a passport is given. And that's all I can say for now. I've made that point so many times before that me as Minister of Finance, what I want to know is when a passport is delivered. These three things have happened, either of them. So they must account to me what has happened when a passport is given. I made that point so many times before. I don't know why it's very difficult for that point to be understood, which is my role as far as that's concerned. The minister will speak on Tuesday about, about, about the, the other things. But me, that's what my concern is. I've made that point so many times. I don't know if you just... As if even they're not hearing it or they choose not to hear it. I don't know what was happening. All the other things that, 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 that you, you speak of, the minister said to you, he said to you, he will, he will, we will lay the report in, in, in the parliament. The report that, was, that thought, people thought had disappeared, it is laid in the, in, the, in, the, in the parliament. When that's laid, the minister will make a statement. At that time, the minister can be asked, Whatever question he wants, you want, about a statement. As a, as a Minister of Finance, I am, again, don't shoot the messenger. As a, minister, as a Minister of Finance and Minister of National Security, what is of my paramount importance is that when any individual has a St. Lucian passport, the document in his hands, He's a person of good repute. So. Mr. Frenos, um, <coughs> St. Kitts did not see the delivery of the uh, infrastructure project uh, that Caribbean Galaxy should have done there. 
Are you concerned at all that St. Lucia may find itself not being uh, in receipt of whether it be the infrastructure uh, program from Caribbean Galaxy or the hotel that Caribbean Galaxy is uh, building? I'm concerned about any investment that doesn't happen. I'm very concerned about any investment. Anything that will stymie the development of the country, I'm concerned about it. I'm very concerned about it. But what I can do, I can't speculate. I have to wait and see. I can't speculate. I can't speculate in the future. I can't. I have to wait and see. But what, I'm, what I tell you, and it's a point that I want you to listen to and understand, my concern is that when an individual gets a passport from St. Lucia, a passport. When he has the thing that says the Minister of Finance gives to Lisa Joseph a passport of St. Lucia, that individual is a person of good repute. He or his dependents. That's that's my gravest concern. You can hit me, you can figure that 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 is not right. But that's my concern. But with the allegations that uh, Caribbean Galaxy would perhaps have millions, hundreds of millions I am not. I understand about the escrow account, and I've, and I've been informed that the escrow account has been reconciled, or has been reconciled, or is being reconciled, or was reconciled. So I can only go with the information that I have. And but that information was given to you as of when? The, recon the reconciliation, you know, first of all, you should ask first one question. The escrow account was supposed to be in St. Lucia. You must ask why and who approved it for it not to be in St. Lucia. First question. But you also did say that the banks did not want to touch the CIT escrow account. I didn't say so. I said, I, no, no, no. I said, can you don't get me right. I, 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 you must tip me. I said, no, no. I, it's very You know, I did something, um, I Lisa. Right Lisa, I'm very, I want to tell you something that's very, I said, that the es anyone who goes to the escrow account must be properly, the due diligence must be clear. And some banks sometimes have concerns about the due diligence as far as escrow accounts are concerned. I said so. But I didn't say the bank did not. Can be right. But because my, I've always spoken about due diligence. I've been persistent and consistent. You seem to forget that. Well, not you. P people forget that. My only discussion has been on due diligence, you know. My only discussion. Anytime I speak about the CIP, what I say is due diligence. That's all I say. And if you, if you go back, you check the records, but conveniently, people cut piece, take another piece, join together, and to create the, the, the hype. But I've always been consistent, Lisa, on due diligence. And I know you're a truthful person, you'll agree. I've always been consistent. I've always I've been consistent all the Hey, I've, been, I've been consistent on two things. One, one thing, due diligence, and two, let the courts decide. I've been consistent on that, and I've also said, if the courts find anybody guilty, I will take action. I've been consistent on that. And you didn't tell me as of when your information about the reconciliation? The, I've been, again, you see, Lisa, you... Lisa, that's a fine question. Lisa, you are... You want to ask me these questions, and I know you don't intend them to be trick questions. No. Nah, I know. No, I you want to give me, you want to give me, you want me to give you dates. But the Prime Minister said on the 8th of July. I'm not going to do that. 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 An approximate? What I'm going to tell you is that when I asked, I was told that the escrow comes reconciled. I'm not going to get dead. I don't get caught. You see, we're dealing, you know, I tell you something. What, you, what are you doing if it's an entire scenario to bring me into disrepute? Yes, I'm convinced about it. And it started a long time ago with House and Cap Estate, BMW bought by, 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 by businessmen. It's a long time. So right now, it's so... So I have to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to always speak the truth. And when I make an error, 
I'm not God. I said, I made an error. You know, they, there are some people who believe they are gods. They are engineers, they are psychologists, they are, they, they are mechanics, they, they are doctors, they can judge, they can judge the, the cleanliness of buildings, they can, they, 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 they can know whether somebody is clean or not clean. They, you know, honestly, I, I'm not like that. I, uh, I stick to my core competencies and I take advice and I make my decisions based on advice. I've told you so long time ago, and if you can check and that is why you see some of my critics say, I don't know, I, I, or, or, you know, I, I, I know. What I know is I have to be careful what I say, because if I wasn't not careful with what I say, the kind of traps that have been set for me are the falling it already. Thank you very, very much. Saying you okay? I want you to read that book. I want, I have a copy. In fact, I must have in my office. You want it now? I have, I have it. No, it's not mine, huh? No, I have an autograph. I'll get one. I have it. I have it. You must read it. You must read it. You must read it to see what, what, you, what you're up against. Not you. What we up against in that scenario. Okay. To make sure what young journalists are up against. Yeah, we, we, why? I, I know.